Let me tell you about the very rich, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote in 1926. They are different from you and me. They think, deep in their hearts, that they are better than we are. Even when they enter deep into our world or sink below us, they still think they are better than we are. They are different. Fitzgerald's insight is a key to understanding why so many Americans are frustrated with politics. To such an extent, some have begun to hate the whole system. The enormous fortunes of the top 1% in wealth and income allow the very rich to escape living the common life of a typical American. Wealth affords one the luxury of not working if one so chooses, and therefore the ability to escape from the quiet desperation of making a living by being dependent on the wages from the grind of a job. Wealth allows one to live in mansions, on private estates, sheltered from intimate contact with the squalor of cities in decay. Wealth affords one a freedom of mobility, where one becomes unbounded by place and independent from any sense of community. Wealth allows one to replace dependence on public services with better quality services from the private sector, freeing one's children from entrapment in underperforming public schools by having the financial ability to send them to private academies, relieving one's family from any anxiety regarding medical care by having the financial ability to self-insure, insulating one's property from underfunded police departments by having the ability to afford private security, even avoiding the delays and lines at public airports by having the ability to own private jets. Wealth tends to confer a freedom the rest of us do not have, but aspire to in our fantasies. The removal of financial limits on all types of self-indulgence, the evasion of bureaucratic procedures that ordinarily apply, the excusing of uncouth or antisocial behavior, the mitigation of legal consequences resulting from one's foolish judgments or immoral choices. Wealth, in effect, largely isolates one from the common life experience lived by most Americans, and, in a society that blindly admires wealth, tends to lead the wealthy to an inflated sense of their own ego and self-importance, and, like everyone else, unless humbled by strong religious values or a social ethic of noble obligation, a wealthy individual naturally adopts a political and worldview largely shaped by his or her financial situation. That must necessarily be fundamentally different from typical Americans on nearly all political topics. Let a few examples suffice to prove this observation. On illegal immigration, the typical American, directly experiencing the social disruption of illegal immigration in rising crime, overextended schools, and a growing local tax burden, wants illegal immigration stopped. The very rich, on the contrary, insulated from experiencing the social disruption of illegal immigration and instead enjoying cheap, abundant sources of docile labor for their businesses and their households, welcome mass immigration, whether legal or illegal. On globalization, so-called free trade, and outsourcing. The typical American, dependent on a good job, paying a decent living wage, is continually threatened with expulsion from the middle class due to job loss from this trilateral policy. The very rich, on the contrary, deriving their income from capital and investment, independent from a job's wage, eagerly anticipate greater profits and wealth appreciation from globalization, so-called free trade, and outsourcing. On traditional values, the typical American, accustomed to the limits inherent in living the common life, preferring an unambiguous and unwavering moral code, even if they struggle to live up to its demands, and having more to lose from individual and communal moral failure, generally support the conservative traditional values that made American society. The very rich, on the contrary, unaccustomed to restrictions of any kind, have a general tendency to display a haughty intolerance for societal restraints on either economic profit 
or personal self-indulgence, and therefore tend to have contempt for the traditional values of American society, as well as regarding typical Americans with scorn as racist, fanatically religious, and sexually repressed. On patriotism, because American society, until recently, has allowed average people to live better than any other people in history, typical Americans are deeply patriotic and diligently suspicious of any philosophy, language, culture, or foreign government that threatens to disrupt American society. The very rich, on the contrary, with their fortunes tied to enterprises that operate across national boundaries, and where national boundaries, languages, cultures, and governments are increasingly irrelevant, feel more kinship with the very rich in other countries than with most of their own countrymen, and thus tend to identify themselves less as American and ever more as citizens of the world in a global community without nations where national borders and national sovereignty are considered outdated. As these four examples reveal, the profound disparity in political outlook between the very rich and typical Americans is mutually exclusive. Consequently, the policies and resultant laws preferred by the very rich do not and cannot accrue to the benefit of the vast majority of typical Americans or for the common good. The very rich, whether they are country club conservative Republicans or latte drinking limousine liberal Democrats, set aside differences they may have between themselves when it comes to defending from challenge policies critical to their continued power, such as open borders, globalization, secular values, and global military intervention. Despite our vaunted two-party system, there is non-competition across basic investor interests, since neither party can oppose the fundamental policy preferences of their very rich contributors. And if we look at the record and not the rhetoric, we find that the United States is basically a one-party country, effectively ruled by a single coalition of wealthy individuals and big corporations with two wings, known as the Democratic and Republican parties, presiding over a political system where typical Americans are disempowered from exerting any direct control, where the essential details of most law is made hidden from public view, and where government policy, public political discourse, and nearly all candidates are under the strict control of corporations and institutions owned by the very rich.